Lord, if, if there's something standing in our way between you and us, kiss us with forgiveness tonight, God. Father, if, if we're feeling lonely or, or feeling like we are, we're lacking somewhere and we need a hug from Daddy, we ask you, Lord, to kiss us with affection tonight, Father. Lord, let the kisses of thy mouth be upon us tonight, oh God. We give you glory and we praise you over this word tonight. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. All right, what are we teaching tonight? Okay, it's a story, uh, it's a love story between the bride and the bridegroom, but at this point, they're just shepherd and shepherdess. Now, why is it as Christians do we need to go further than where we are at right now? All right, how many remember that we studied about the three courts in the tabernacle? There's three courts. One is called the outer court. Okay, and anyone could go here. And there was two pieces of furniture there. The other one was called the inner court. And there were three pieces of furniture there. And then one was the holy of holies. This is a 30-fold Christian in the outer court. This means that's all you want. You're not hungry for more. You want to get saved, but you don't want to go any deeper. That's all you want. You're, you're, you know, you might visit in a little deeper realm sometimes, but, but you don't really want to go any further. Some people go into the 60 realm, into the middle court, and they get baptized with the Holy Spirit. They begin to have the Word of God flowing through them. They begin to memorize Scripture and know how to use them. And then there's the hundredfold realm. Does anybody know what was in that room? The Ark of the Covenant. That's where God met with man, and that's where God forgave Israel, was on that atonement seat. Now, not only that, but God was able to uh, vis have a visitation with the representative. Now, this is what we want. We want to be a hundredfold Christians. We don't want to stay in the 30 or the 60 because you're limited. The Bible said, God said, you've limited the Holy One of Israel. How do you limit God as an individual, as a person? How do you limit God? You limit God through your lack of knowledge, through your lack of understanding, through your lack of ability to place authority on what you know to be yours. You see, if, if someone was yelling at someone else's kid, I might have authority to say something just because it's rude. But when they're yelling at my kid, it's a different story. We don't know our authority. We don't know our value. We don't know our worth. And until we know what the lines of the law are, we won't understand the voice of authority. You have certain authority when you come to Christ. Sometimes the enemy has authority in areas. Let's say you're a Korean Christian in North Korea and you get arrested. They may have the authority. God may allow them to have the authority to arrest you in North Korea for being a Christian. They may have the spiritual authority to um, torture you. God may allow them to have that authority. But there may be coming a time in that a prison situation and I've seen it many times where the enemy oversteps his bounds and then the imprisoned Christian is allowed to stand up and say something that just really shakes the atmosphere why because that Christian knows when to submit that God is allowing something and they know when to stand up and put the law down and you've got to really be versed the enemy that we're dealing with is a legalist. He knows his legal boundaries and he will push those until he comes up to somebody who knows the law also and knows where the enemy is pushing beyond his line. When I first came into um, real spiritual authority and warfare, God began to teach me. I'd have sometimes uh, demonic spirits that would come in my room. And the Lord began to teach me. One time I was ministering to uh, a young man who had demon powers. And during the night, this spirit came in my room. The first thing the Lord taught me to establish is he, is this demon power here because God's allowing him here? 
Maybe I have to speak to that principality and tell him where his lines are and where he's allowed and where he is not allowed and put a legal authority. Or maybe they're just coming in as a tormenting spirit. And in that case, I'm able to quickly get rid of them. So the same thing with trials in your life. Some trials God allows and you're, um, you're, you're to go through that trial. You're to submit to whatever you're going through. Other times, it's something that is not legally uh, prepared for you or allowed by God. And the Holy Spirit can rise in you and command that situation. How many know what I'm talking about? Now, how do you know the difference? You have to be led by the Spirit. You have to know the laws of God. That's why when we get into the Song of Solomon, when she says, draw me, what she is saying there is, you know, Lord, when you are able to best reach me, you know what season I'm in, you know where I'm at. Now, how many was here last Wednesday when we taught? Who all was here? All right, we rephrased something we'd done the week before called the in and the out pasture. Do you remember that? Okay, John 10, 9 says um, that you'll go, I just say you'll, you'll go in and out and find pasture. There's two pastures. The in pastures where the presence of God is just filling you, leading you. You're feeling happy. You're feeling satisfied. You're feeling comforted and warm. The out pasture when God is when God takes you out to circumstance situations in your life to where it's not comfortable, where it's cold, where you're hungry, where things aren't going well. And he tries the word in you. He brands it. How many knows when you brand something, it's been in the fire and then it goes on, let's say, if you're doing cattle. You go from the fire of the branding into the cattle and it sears that mark on the, on the cattle, Right? This is what trials do in your life. So when you're in the end pasture and God's glory is on you and you learn that the bride says, draw me, we will run after you. Then in the out pasture, when you're not feeling his presence and you're not able to break through, you can take that law and you can say, Lord, draw me. I need to know your word for this hour. So we're learning things in the spirit realm. Spiritual authority is not just words. There has to be a spiritual authority behind those words. If you're trying to give authority to a situation and God's not behind you, they're just empty words. Jesus said, break me away from the shore. Let me be in the boat and let me teach these people because I'm too close. They're not really... They're not really getting it. I'm going to have to pull back and give it to them from another angle. The Lord knows when your seasons of out pasture or when your seasons of in pasture is upon you. And he will brand things into your spirit through circumstance and trial. And you will learn to walk out the word of God in those situations so that they become a part of you. Because when they're just theory... When I'm just telling you laws, it's just a theory until God brands that law in your spirit through circumstance and situation in the out pasture. And this is what we're learning in the Song of Solomon. Where is her authority? Where does she get it? And how does it work? One of the things she has to learn is obedience. When you are quick to obey God, he is quicker the next time to give you instruction. On the other hand, when you drag your feet and you don't obey God, he withdraws things because you haven't gotten to the point where he can trust you with the authority that comes with obedience. Amen? She said in verse 6, I'm just going to go through here, look not upon me because I am black, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me, and they made me the keeper of the vineyards. But my own vineyard have I not kept. She came under persecution. People got jealous of her. They gave her extra responsibility that she was not ready for. And because of that, she neglected her own spiritual life. You, as you're growing in God, cannot allow ministry or anything else to 
to uproot you from your growth system. Everything must be a part of your root system. You don't leave your roots there and run over here. The most important thing in your spiritual life is your development with your relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing trumps that. Not friends or family or ministry. And I've seen many ministries bite the dust because they let their prayer life, their relationship with God go because they thought ministry was more important than relationship. Jesus said, I don't do anything I don't see the Father do. And consequently, her own vineyard was not kept. She did not keep what God had given her. God walks into your garden. In here is a garden. And the Bible in the Song of Solomon talks about that garden. In here is a garden. And what he wants you to do is set a table for him in that place. He wants to to grow some mature fruit, some mature things inside of your garden, so that he can walk in and you can say, here's my praise, here's my love, here's where I matured, where I used to be immature i don't lose my temper like i used to i'm i'm running to the word of god instead of running to my own strength and he comes in there and he eats that he enjoys that he fellowships with your growth he fellowships with your joy he fellowships with your praise it draws you into one you have a common bond you have a common interest you and god are both interested in that garden in your heart Amen? Don't let it go to waste. Don't let the enemy. The Bible says later, and I think in even Song of Solomon, I'm not sure, the fox, little foxes spoil the vine. And what she's saying is, see what that word means? The foxes means empty of hand. God comes to your table in your garden, and there's nothing there to feed him. Oh, God, I would praise you right now, but I'm just exhausted. I'm just, Lord, I would, I, would, uh, I would go minister to that person right now, but I just can't do it. I'm still upset. Or why, those little things have come into that garden, nibbled at the fruit that you have grown. Your time has not been spent in developing your relationship, and the fruit that you've grown is no good now. The foxes have come in and you are empty of hand and have nothing to offer. The Bible said to be ready with an answer when someone asks you of what God's done, of that that work that he started in you. You've got to be ready with an answer. Amen? All right. Last week we also studied about, I have compared the oh my love to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. Now, what I didn't tell you was that chariots represent transportation. And here's what he's saying. You're not only one of the choice horses. To be a Pharaoh's horse, you had to be the best, the fastest, the strongest. And then we went over all the 14 or 17 different sides of the horse of faith. He said, not only, honey, are you... Do you have these attributes of the horse of faith? He said, but that, those attributes that you've grown, the fruits of the spirit that you have grown, are actually a transportation mode for you to go from one realm to another. And they're a transportation mode for you to take passengers from one realm to another. Now, what I'm saying is this. The ability you have to be personal with God will allow you to go from an earthly understanding to a heavenly perspective. Amen? And in that heavenly perspective, other people will learn to follow that trail. And so, she, he says, I compared you. Lord, here, uh, daughter or, or lover, oh, my love, to a company of horses and chariots, uh, Pharaoh's chariots. I'm just going to go back over just one of those. We compared it with Job 39, 19 through 25. I'm just going to go over one of those um, neck of thun- clothed with thunder. Neck clothed with thunder. You can write it down. We don't really have time to go over this. This was last week's food but i'm giving a little appetizer okay now 
the horse of faith that she was growing had a neck clothed with thunder. In the natural, thunder is a demonstration of union. After lightning splits the sky, a clap of thunder occurs as the clouds are again united. This same principle works in the spiritual. Hear me out because this is a very important principle. The horse of faith carries the witness, the thunder, that there has been a union of the Holy Ghost with the Word of God. Now let me explain it this way. Some of you are already tracking. We have a cloud, okay? I'm not an artist, so. We have a cloud. Lightning is truth or the Word of God that comes in. How many knows that there is something happens when you hear truth? There's a witness inside. All right, this, this, this word of God comes down in lightning, okay? It splits the cloud. One side is the word or the truth that you just heard. The word or the truth that you just heard or felt or sensed. The other side is what? Can anybody remember before I write it down? Huh? Yes, it is spirit. It is spirit. Thank you, because I would have forgotten that element of it. But it's what, what, what is the spirit? What does the spirit do when it hears the word? It brings a witness. Now there's two of you hearing it. You're hearing it, and the spirit of God within you is hearing it. That's why love language is so important to God. Because you're saying it, God's hearing it, you're getting a witness, and you got the full trinity in operation. You got that? You're saying the word of God, you're using your love language, you're learning your principles, and you're saying it to God. The spirit of God that lives within you is hearing you say it. And then God is backing it up because of the three coming together. So what happens is you hear the word, it rings true, and you get something in your spirit that rises up and witnesses and said, yes, that's right. That's true. I need that. I need to understand that. Have you ever had that happen? Anyone? Okay. That's one of the elements of the horse of faith that he's comparing her to. He said, honey... You have your neck, and, and the neck represents the will. The neck and the jaw represent your will. Now, if you see somebody, and we're going to see this in a later verse, when you see someone with a fixed jaw, what does that tell you? Several things, right? Someone's got a fixed jaw. Right. It can mean several things. It, there's a determination or an anger or, or something going on there. It's showing you the will. The will's not going to be, you know, uh, I'm not going to budge. You're not going to get me, you know. Um, and then if you see someone with a pliable jaw, that says that their will is more subdued and more submissive. Now, in the spirit realm, when we're talking about the bride, in facing the bridegroom, she wants a submissive will, right? She doesn't want a, fi a fixed jaw because she's got to learn to be submissive. But the neck, the Bible says later in Song of Psalm, is a tower. The Bible said the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it. So this tower... This will is giving a place, a vantage point, a viewpoint that enables you because you're submitting your will to God. It gives you a chariot ride into higher heights with a ver better view so that you can see what God is doing in your life and where he's taking you. But many times he blindly or you're blindly being led because that's what faith is. So you see how interchangeable these things are? Sometimes God's allowing you to understand why you're going through what you're doing. And other times he doesn't say a word. You know why? Because he's teaching you to have that word branded on your spirit. Are you still going to follow me? It's like this. When you're in love with somebody and they go far away. I remember a boyfriend of mine years ago. I was going away to Bible school and he wrote me a letter and he said, this will be the acid test of our love. I'll never forget that line. This will be the acid test of our love. 
And sure enough, it was. It was. So when that person that loves you or you love or you're not together, there's a testing time. Are you going to be faithful? Did you mean what you said? Is this really where you want to go? And this is what God does in the outpasture. He withdraws his presence to see, see that suppose the last thing you said to him is, honey, I love you and I'll be back. Okay. And then you don't see him. You don't hear from him. You begin to wonder, did they, was that true? Are they really coming back? Do they really mean it? And we go through all these things. But one day they show up and then you know they meant what they said and said what they meant. But you're being tested. Many a soldier has gone away and got a Dear John letter. I mean, knows what that is. They've gone away to war and they get a Dear John letter. And so this is what God does in this out pasture and in, in all these circumstances. He begins to see what's been branded. What stuck? What stuck? Did that really stick? What did Peter say? He said, Lord, though everybody turns away from you, I won't. Though everyone else turns away, I won't. And Jesus said, let me tell you something. He said, before even morning, he said, you're going to deny me three times. See, the Lord was testing him in the out pasture. But what did it bring? What came out of that? Repentance. And Peter saw what was really in him, right? He thought, did he believe he would not strand God? Didn't he believe that? He really believed that. He really thought what he said to Jesus, though everyone denies you, I won't. Key factor. When you will not be able to walk this Christian journey out on your own. You're going to need a savior. And we've got the best savior in the world. Amen. Amen. There's no better savior. Hallelujah. When you fall and when you fail, it's pride that turns around and says, oh, I shouldn't have done oh, what's the matter with me. You know, no, you come before him and you fall and you say, Lord, I am so human. Help me. Pick me up. I need a savior. Amen. Amen. I need a savior. And boy, he's there. Amen. Hallelujah. He's right there. This is what you're learning in the outpasture. And you know what? It's better than silver and gold. Because once you learn God and how he operates, you can walk through your Christian life. And the Bible says, and nothing sh shook them. You can walk through where nothing shakes you. Where nothing, where you understand that God has a purpose and then you understand your spiritual authority. Okay, let's go on with tonight's verse, chapter 1, verse 10. He says to the bride, and this is a very beautiful principle, thy cheeks are comely. That means they're beautiful. Uh, they're attractive. With rows of jewels. Thy neck with chains of gold. Now again, the word cheek here refers to the jaw. And this gives a visible demonstration of an invisible will. And he says, honey, I've looked at you. And I've looked at your cheeks. And I've looked at your will. And you're surrendered. And... When we visit in pastures of humility and surrender and crucifixion and allow him to expose these areas to us and repent of them, it's the place to grow. All right. When we visit pastures of humility, surrender and crucifixion and allow him to expose and remove our blemishes and imperfections, ugly scars at empty places will not remain. Listen, this is so very important. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now here's the principle. He says, I see your cheeks. Your will is pliable and it's powerful. He says, and I see the jewels. Do you know why she had jewels in her cheeks? Because God had done a blemish removal on her. He had gone through the different parts of her character and her nature and had said, look at this, honey. This needs to be dug out. And she says, okay, God, I don't want that in my life. I don't want that. It's, it's, in, 
It's causing me harm. It's causing people I love harm. Take it out, God, however you have to do it. Do the extraction. Now, when something's extracted, it's painful. It hurts. When you lose someone you love, whether they die or whether they leave you, it's painful and it hurts. But it is a removal of a blemish because you're putting a position on someone that only God is supposed to have. How many have heard someone say, I don't want to live anymore? You know why? Because you're living for the wrong thing. You were created to live for him. So when you allow God, when in your losses, you allow God to take those blemishes out. You know what? It doesn't leave an ugly scar when God's through with it. When you surrender it to God, he puts a jewel, puts a crown, puts a jewel, and he says, guess what, sweetheart? Every time you look at this jewel and you think about that loss, when I had to take that out of your life, you will remember that I blessed you with patience and love and gentleness because of it, or what have you. So every time, God never takes away that he doesn't give back so much greater than what you lost. If we learn that principle, we wouldn't be so angry when God puts his finger on something. Amen? And he says, sweetheart, your cheeks are beautiful. I see, I don't see the blemishes that were there. I don't see the scars that being removed caused. He said, I see all those jewels in there. And every time I dealt with you, you yielded your spirit to me. And I was able to replace those ugly blemishes and scars with something beautiful and precious and wonderful. And when I look at you, sweetheart, I see the times that you surrendered yourself to me. When you allowed yourself to be broken. And he says, thy neck with chains of gold. The Bible says that he that being often reproved, hardened his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Proverbs 29.1. See, God is going to... Uh, uh, reprove you often because he's working on you you want to get there faster right yes or no yeah. you want it to take 60 years or what okay then it's going to be painful and he's going to have to dig deep so he said when i often reprove you he says um don't harden your neck because if you start hardening yourself you're going to be cut off from me and there'll be no remedy at that point There'll be no way I can help you. You've chosen your path. But the bride's will was so yielded that he rewarded her with chains of gold. And here's how I see it. I see two chains of gold. Because he says chains. This is the way I see it in my spirit. Only in that day, only the wealthy and royalty could wear chains of gold. And what does gold speak of? And divinity, divine nature, divine character. She has gained this through the furnace of affliction. God said to Israel, I have chosen you out of the furnace of affliction. He didn't choose her out of the palaces. We studied that. Where did he meet the bride, the shepherd girl? Where did the bridegroom meet her? Out in the field. Out in the field and the sun was on her and beaten on her and that's where he met her he met her in the furnace of, of affliction he didn't meet her in the bed of comfort and ease did he he met her in a difficult situation and he says i found you in the furnace of affliction so the first chain of gold that could be referred to as a choker girls used to wear it, the ones that are closer to the neck could represent the fact she has chosen to choke out her will in preference to his the second was a chain to speak of a reward for the beauty that she now possesses so what he's what this language is doing it's showing you that with each thing you go through there is a reward system and there is a remembrance of the things that you've given up and you've done so with one of them in other words there's there's some lessons you learn like when you're a kid, if you touch something hot, you learn very quickly it burns, right? So when you go to, to give in to impulse again to do that, you pull that first choker and you go, no, don't do that. It hurts. See? So he gave her with these 
two chains. The first one was a warning. It was something she had learned previously that could be put into use in future uh, events. If you've ever rolled a car, by a, had an accident and you rolled your car and you were on black ice or something, from then on, you pull that choker back and you go, wait a minute, I can't drive like this on this kind of road, right? That's a choker to pull the self-life back and say, wait a minute, I've been here before. The other one was just an adornment to say, sweetheart, I love you. And you know how he does that? He comes in and he speaks to you or you feel his presence. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like that intimate moment. I had one this last week and it was so beneficial to me. And the Lord began to it was almost like I went into the being of God. And as I begin to pray, I begin to pray from God's voice and his perspective. In other words, um, an illustration of what God began to do. And it was just so overwhelming is I begin to say, God, sometimes don't you just want to be God? Don't you want to not just be veiled and, and talk to your people in dark sentences and understandings and clothing yourself with illustrations and don't you just want to be who you are sometimes God don't you just want to be the Red Sea parting walking on the water speaking to the storm God sometimes don't you just want to come in and take the, the affection of your heart and that person and just draw them to your soul and just kiss them and love them and hug them don't you just sometimes want to step over that darkness between us and just invade my privacy and say I'm here sweetheart to take over I said don't you sometimes God want to bypass all of our sins and all our neglect and all these areas in our lives that stand between us don't you just want to slice through it and just come in and just embrace us with your fullness and I just began to what I was doing during that is I could see God saying this is what he wanted he was saying this is what I want I don't want to be veiled to my people I don't want to be standing in a dark shadow behind a war behind three curtains and waiting for someone to do all the purification and all this and all that in order to get to me I want them to be washed in the blood of the lamb so they can say God I'm here I want intimacy with you and I'll rip the curtains and I'll let her in hallelujah too long has God been held back from us by our own uh, uh, mistakes and our own deceived nature and, and it's kept the presence and, and, and I believe we're going into a time where this, where this song of Solomon is going to be our daily manna, our daily bread and, and God's going to sit there and he's going to say, do you mean it? Is that really, you're really hot after me? You're really in love and passionate for me? Oh, and he'll stand back and he'll wait and he'll see and he'll test and he'll try and the day's going to come in one of the scriptures that talks about God jumping on his fiery chariot. Hallelujah. And I just see the bridegroom saying, I can't wait another second. I've got to kiss my bride. I've got to be where she is. I'm going to tear the curtains. I'm going to jump in the chariot and I'm going to be with her. Oh, how many want that in your life? Hallelujah. Come on, let's just praise him a minute. Thank you, Lord. You're so wonderful, Jesus. Oh, God give us our prayer language to praise you, to worship you, Lord. Choke out the self-life, oh God. Oh, show us your beauty. Show us your divine nature, oh God. Oh, how I praise you, Lord, for being so awesome in this place. Oh, thank you for the work you've done. Thank you for calling me out of darkness into light. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, thank you, Jesus, for defending us and fighting for us, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Rabakanda, rabba, rabba, so rabba, kaya, 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 rabba,
Mm, thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus. More, Father. More praise. Come on. Give it to him. Give it to him. More worship. More praise. More. Oh, Jesus, how we love you. Give us that love language, Lord, that will attract you to us, oh, God. We need you, Lord. You've done such a work, Lord, to be able to split that curtain, oh, Lord. How awesome it is, oh, God. Oh, hallelujah, it's all that matters is being in your presence, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Verse 111 says, we will make the borders of gold with studs of silver. And what is happening here is there's a divine decree going forth. And it's saying, because you've decided to allow your will to be, to be my will, he said, um, all those who look, they're going to make you these beautiful uh, gold and studs of silver. And uh, I liken that to an illustration in the Bible that talks about if a man or a woman had been a slave and it come to the end of their term of being a slave, they had a choice. If a man says, I've married a wife in this and I've had children here and I, and I want to stay with this owner and I could get my freedom, but I choose to be a servant or a slave. It's called, he was called a love slave. And what they would do is they would take him and they would um, pierce, if you will, but a little bit bigger than that, uh, his ear. And they would put in there a, a particular uh, earring that established him as being a permanent possession of that owner. This is what Jesus wants to do, guys. He wants to be the permanent owner of you. And he says, I'm going to do it two ways, through silver and through gold. Who knows what silver means? Redemption. Write that down. Silver means redemption. Gold means deity. Now, what goes through the ear? Redemption. Because there's no way you can belong to God unless he redeems you first. He has to redeem you. So that goes into the ear first. He says, in order for me to own you, I've got to pierce your flesh, your will, your desire. I've got to go past what's comfortable for you, what you would like to see or what feels fuzzy and warm. I've got to pierce. There's got to be pain. There's got to be suffering. There's got to be a laying down of your will. And he said, I'll put that redemption in there then. And then I'll put a whole border of myself of deity and gold. And you will be my love slave. And you'll get that passion that I have for you. And you'll, and you'll give me the passion that you have for me. And we'll be just two happy campers. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap tonight for that. So it is with the bride, having been set free by the blood of Jesus, she no longer desires to leave him, but have a permanent union with him. I'm going to end with this last verse, 12. While the king sitteth at his table, my spikenard sendeth forth the smell thereof. Spikenard means peace. And so where was he sitting at the table? We talked about that a few minutes ago. Where was that table? In here, very good, in your garden, awesome, right there. He's come in and he said, I want to see what's growing inside of you. I want to see where you've surrendered yourself and espoused yourself to me. And he sits down at the table and she's just full of peace because she has a, a beautiful setting for the bridegroom. She has established a place in her for him. The minute he comes, she's ready to let him in. And uh, this story is likened unto the story of Mary of Bethany who broke open the spikenard and poured it out on Jesus' feet and it sent a beautiful aroma unto the house. And this is what happens when you're at peace and God is feeding in the inside of you and you have something to offer him. It sends out an aroma and, and it's an attractive aroma. How many have been somewhere where someone just, they got it? All of a sudden they got it. Hallelujah. They begin to understand and Jesus saved them and they were on their way to hell and, or whatever. They got the revelation and they're weeping or they're shouting and it sends an aroma and, and it's contagious and everybody in the room gets it. When David starts praying and crying and, and putting those beautiful words together, I call him a word master in my head. And when he does that, it puts me on the bandwagon. I smell that aroma and I begin to partake of it myself. Yeah. And that's what happens when you're 
sending out that spike nard when the king is abiding in there and he's in there and he comes and he's eating the fruit of what you've de- been developed inside of you then he's then you're you're full of peace and everybody is like so many things are happening why are you at peace why aren't you upset or or why aren't you mad at that person that just said that or or why you know because you don't understand everything else pales the king is sitting in my garden and I can feel his peace he has established himself in me it doesn't matter what happens out there and you know what that does to you as a bystander it makes you want it too someone say I want it too father we love you the word says he will come in and sup with us and we with him when you sacrifice to show him your love or you are just diligent in your adoration um, you'll find him coming often to enjoy the work he's done in you and we have to be extravagant in that because the more extravagant we are in giving him our praise and our love the more extravagant he is to give it back I want to read this because King David was a warrior. It's about, this is from David's heart, and it's what Brenda's talking about, taking what's in your heart and putting it into words. And sometimes just kind of taking a, a dramatic stand where you just stand against the tide of everything that's going on in your life. And you say, this is what I am. I'm a warrior that loves God. This but, but we got to begin. You develop this sense of I am living my life before God, and He is my God. He is my strength. He is what I'm going to fall on. He is where I'm looking. He's what I'm waiting for. He's who I love to take care of me. I have no other source. I have no other strength. There's no one else for me to look to. And 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 and. Brenda's talking about developing the language of it, and we need to have this heart. But there's there's also a sense that we have to. We I want you guys to come up tonight. That that just want to say that you just want help with this. We want the Lord to help us become men and women that we just stand strong when the trials of life hit us, and we we know where our anchor is. We know where our refuge is. In the storm, there is no one else but God, and it's not only because He is my refuge. I love Him.